Okay, let us go through this theorem and its proof. And as a reminder, this theorem is telling us that under certain conditions, the partial derivatives existing imply that the total derivative exists. So in particular, if the partials exist and are continuous, then f is differentiable. So as we start to prove this, let's go ahead and write out um, kind of more rigorously the statement of the theorem. So I'm going to assume that my f is defined on an open set, an open subset of Rn, and it's going to Rm. And I'm supposing that for every point in my domain, each one of my component functions has all of the partials defined. Yeah. So remember, if we have um, f taking in vectors in our n and spitting out vectors in our m, then we can write our function as, um, so we'll have like f of p would be equal to like f1 of p, f2 of p, and then all the way down to your mth function, right? So we're saying for each of these component functions, all of the partials, right, with respect to all n components in the domain, all those partials exist and the partials are all continuous. The claim, of course, is that our derivative, the total derivative, exists. So at every point, we um, our function is differentiable. Okay, let's go through and just kind of outline the proof. First step is going to be determine a good candidate for that derivative at p. Because if our claim is for every p, the derivative exists, find a good candidate and then show that that candidate satisfies the definition. In other words, show that the remainder, when you use whatever your candidate is for your derivative, show that the remainder is sublinear. And then the second step, right, like how do we do that? How do we show that the remainder is sublinear? Well, we're actually going to um, use the fact that partials exist by kind of just focusing on the value of our function or our component functions along each axis, right? And, um, or in, you know, in each axis direction. So then we'll use the mean value theorem that we proved in 104 repeatedly, and we'll rewrite the remainder in terms involving our partials, okay? We'll be able to do that again by the mean value theorem. And then lastly, we'll use the continuity of the partials to show that the remainder is sublinear, right? So the remainder is now going to be written in terms of partials. The partials will be continuous, and that's how we'll end up concluding that our remainder is sublinear. And that'll be the goal. Okay, so let's get started with step one. And, um, of course, we're just going to fix a point P in our domain. And I probably should make that first. And so here's what we're going to do. Who's going to be our candidate for the derivative of f at p? Well, let a be the matrix of partials of f at p. So I've just kind of written it down here in excruciating detail. But <clears throat> each row, right, so the first row um, is kind of devoted to the partials of the first component. And the ith row um, contains the partials of the ith component, right? So the partial respect x1, x2, x3, all the way um, down the line. This last one will be the partial with respect to xn of fi, okay? And I said let the corresponding linear transformation be t, okay? So every matrix corresponds to a linear transformation. And what we need to show is that with this definition of t that we get from our partials, right, that partial matrix, this remainder, i.e. f of p plus v minus f of p minus t of v, right, that remainder is sublinear. So this ratio goes to zero as v goes to zero. <clears throat> and um, just to kind of check, because remember, our f 
is, you know, consists of m component vectors. So really we'll have like f1 of p plus v, right? f2 of p plus v, um, all the way down to f m of p plus v. So this would be the f equal to f1 of p, f2 of p, fm of p, yeah? Plus, now here's where we would have our a, and then v1, v2, all the way down to vn, and across here would be the partial with respect to x1 of f1 at p. And then da 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 da, da partial with respect to xn, f1 at p. And then down here, the partial with respect to x1, fm at p, right, and so forth. This would be partial with respect to xn, fm at p, yeah? And then plus, and notice, this means we're going to have a remainder that's in components as well. So, plus remainder 1, right, of V1, da, 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 all the way to Vn. Remainder 2, V1, da, 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 Vn. And all the way down to remainder M of V1, da, da, all the way to Vn. And the reason why I'm going through and writing um, these out in vector form is because we're actually going to show that for each uh, component of the remainder, uh, we have sublinearity, okay? So I'm going to be looking at, for instance, F2 minus F2 of P minus this dotted with that, right, as my R2. Does that make sense? Okay, and then showing that the R2 is sublinear. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started here. And here's how we're going to do it. P is fixed. Now, V is a vector, and you think of it as your displacement from P. So V is, um, you know, in the limit, V is getting close to zero. And I've drawn this in three dimensions, but of course, this is going to generalize. Now, V is in our N. So we can rewrite V as this um, in, um, in terms of the standard basis vectors. So it'll be a combination, a linear combination of those. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to form some points to get from P to V following along the coordinate axes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the paths, so the line segments, right? And notice, again, these line segments are going to be parallel to my coordinate axes. So here's how we're going to define this. So my first point is going to be say P naught, and that's just P. And then my second point is gonna be P1, and if I were to draw it in the picture here, it would be like right here, okay? P1 is going to be P plus V1, E1. And then P2 is gonna be P plus V1, E1 plus V2, E2. So in this picture, P2 would be here, and P3 would be P plus V. So notice that what I'm doing really is um, I'll have P, let's see here, Pn, Pn should actually be equal to P plus V, and P, say P, K, is P K minus one plus V K E K. Okay? So in the picture here, I have like P one, here's P naught, P one, P two, and P three. Um, <clears throat> and I'm picking points where notice, I'm now gonna have paths. So I have the path that goes from P to P one, and the path that goes from P one to P two, the path that goes from P2 to P3. So we're going to form paths, 
and I'm going to call these paths sigma, right? So let's say here sigma 1 is the path from P to P1. And there's nothing special about that. We can say sigma k is the path from pk minus 1 to pk. So sigma k actually, sigma k is going to be, we can have a function here, 0, 1, 2, r, m, no, excuse me, 0, 1 to r, n, And sigma k of t is going to be, well, let's see, I want to start at, I want to start at pk minus 1, and I want to end up here. And t is going to go from 0 to 1. So let's just do pk minus 1 plus t vk ek. So let's just double check. From the structure, this will be linear, okay? When t is equal to zero, I'm starting at pk minus one. When t is equal to one, I'm gonna end up at pk, right? Because pk is pk minus one plus vk ek. Okay, so I have these paths. The paths are kind of um, well, the paths, what are the paths doing? Let's see here. The paths are essentially restricting our concern to the change just in one variable, okay? Because as I travel down a path, all the other components of my, you know, domain or my input stay the same. The only thing that changes is that I or that k component, yeah? So, fix i between 1 and m. Now I'm saying fix a coordinate, fix a, we're basically looking at fi, right? So one of the functions, um, <clears throat> one of the output functions. And for each j, so remember fi is going to be a function of x1, x2, all the way up to xn, so for each fi, we have to consider the contribution from the x direction, the x2 direction, the x3, the x nth direction, right? So fix a j and consider the composition fi composed with sigma j. So now what is that going to do? Well, fi composed with sigma j is going to be a function of just one variable. So it's a real valued function of one variable. So the input, I guess, would be something between 0 and 1. And the output is going to be fi of sigma j of t. So remember, sigma j of t is some point along the sigma j path, right? So say if that's sigma j, sigma j of t is some location here. And so we're saying, what is fi on that point right there? And notice t in here, which is subset of r, right? The output here, gonna belong to r. Because our f has, um, each has all of the partials, right? So let's go back to our um, hypothesis here. All of our partials are going to exist. So for fi, it has all of its partials. In particular, the partial as we travel along j, or the partial as we travel along sigma j, <clears throat> in the jth direction, right, the partial of fi with respect to xj, that is also going to exist. So this composition, this composition is actually differentiable. And we can apply the mean value theorem.
And so when I say it's differentiable, you might not believe me. Let's just double check. Ultimately, the goal will be to apply the mean value theorem. But let's just double check. Is this function differentiable at a, at a point T in here? Okay, so I want the derivative with respect to T of Fi composed with sigma J. We're saying, does it exist? Well, it would be the limit as H approaches zero of Fi of sigma J of T plus H minus Fi of sigma J of T over H. Yeah? Okay. Now, what we have to ask ourselves, what again does sigma J of T do? What is sigma J of T plus H? Let's go back to our definition. So if I plug in here sigma J, I'm going to have P sub J minus 1. I'm not going to remember this, so let me copy it. So I'm going to have this is equal to equal to the limit as h goes to 0 fi of uh, p sub j minus 1 plus t plus h v j e j minus fi of p sub j minus 1 plus t vj ej. And all of that divided by h. Okay, and I'm literally just using the definition of my sigma j. Notice the difference between this input and this input. How do these vectors differ? They both live in Rn. They differ by H, Vj, Ej. Right, so if I write out the coordinates of this and the coordinates of this vector, they will be the same except in that jth component, the first one is going to have an extra h v j, and the second one won't. Otherwise, they'll be the same. Now, think back. We know the partial with respect to x j of f i exists. So if v j is equal to zero, this limit is just going to, this limit right here is just going to be equal to zero because this is, this will be, um, this will be F of the same thing, right? And F of this is going to live in RM. F of that is going to live in RM. So this will be zero in RM, okay? Otherwise, Here's what we do. We write this limit as h goes to 0. In the denominator, I'm going to put an h vj multiplied by a vj. And I have fi of this minus fi of that. And what do I have in here? I have. Uh, Pj minus 1 plus T Vj Ej. So that's in both of them. In the first one, I have plus H Vj Ej. And this one, I don't have that. I'm dividing by H, V, J, 
this is going to be my partial of Fi with respect to Xj at this point right here. So I'm going to end up with, or let me just kind of write that down. This is going to be equal to the partial of Fi with respect to Xj at Pj minus 1 plus T Vj Ej. Yeah? So when I compute this derivative, it does exist. How does it exist? How do I know it exists? It exists because by hypothesis, my partials exist. And when I use the limit definition to compute this limit to see does it exist, I can rewrite it as the partial, which I know exists by hypothesis. Yeah? Okay. So the limit's going to be this. So that means this derivative exists and is equal to this times Vj. Yeah? So going back here, let's actually um, introduce some notation. Let's call this, this composition, let's call it G sub J. Okay. <clears throat> so, and I'm looking here, so this is a function, a real value function of one variable. And I wanted to say, I should have said, T is sent to this, right? And my F I composed with sigma J goes from 0, 1 to R. That's what I should have written. And so now I'm going to kind of add in what we found out. Indeed, G prime of J at T is equal to this partial times V J. So what we have is, we have a function, gj, g sub j, um, it's going to be, gj is going to be continuous on this uh, domain from 0 to 1. It is differentiable at every point in here, right, and even more actually, because we know that p is in an open set, and p plus v is in an open set, so we've got some wiggle room around here, so... Um, our line segments have, uh, our functions are still defined here, right? And even a little bit past here. Um, that means we can apply the mean value theorem. So we're going to apply the mean value theorem to G sub J. Let me just take this and... label this because what we did here was y is g sub j differentiable. That's what this page is explaining. And then the short answer is because the partials of f exist by hypothesis. Okay. So now let's let's apply the mean value theorem to G sub J to get that there exists some T and let's call it T I J belonging to 0, 1, such that g prime, gj prime of tij is equal to g of 1 minus g of 0 divided by 1 minus 0. The reason why I'm doing the i is because all of this work is happening in the ith component. Yes? 
Okay. Now, what is g of 1? Well, remember, the whole point of g was to have the composition of fi with sigma j. So g sub j at 1 is going to be one endpoint of sigma j, right? So fi evaluated at one endpoint minus fi evaluated at the, kind of like fi at the end minus fi at the beginning. So <clears throat> let's see here. If I actually put in g i g j of 1, so I plug in t equals 1, Okay, then I'm going to get sigma j, okay, um, pj. So it'll be fi of pj so g of 0 is fi of pj and again this is with the sub um, subscript of J. GJ, oh no, sorry, that's GJ of 1. GJ of 0 is going to be FI of P sub J minus 1. Okay. And then GJ prime of TIJ, we said it's going to be equal to this, what we got right here. And we can replace this T with TIJ. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. If we look back at our picture, right, and I'm just going to use this as our kind of our example here. We're saying that G of 1 minus G of 0 over 1 minus 0, which would be F at this point minus f at this point is equal to g prime of some t, right? There exists some t somewhere along this path. And the derivative of g at that point is equal to g at the end point minus g at the beginning point. It just so happens that this g prime is related to the partial of f i Right, with respect to xj. Yeah, so what we're going to do is add together the derivatives along the path all the way from p plus v down to p. So when I look at, I'm going to let j uh, range over all of the possibilities. And I'll have G at this endpoint, or so sorry, F of P plus V minus F of P2, right, is equal to some derivative, right, here. And then plus F here minus F here plus F here minus F here. The um, these sums are telescoping, so I'm just going to end up with f here minus f here. So my f of p plus v minus f of p is going to end up being the sum of some partial derivatives at some points along the path, and these points are guaranteed to exist by applying the mean value theorem, okay? So let's add it all together. So we'll say adding it all together. Well, let me make this smaller so we have room. So adding together over all 
J. So the sum of the gj of 1 minus gj of 0 over 1 minus 0 is going to be equal to the sum of our gj prime of tij, right? And this is by the mean value theorem. There exists tij belonging to 0, 1 such that the following is true. Okay, now the left hand side is just going to be equal to the sum over j, gj of 1 minus gj of 0, which we said is equal to f i of p plus v minus fi of p. And this is since the sum is telescoping. Okay? And this is we're just dividing by 1. So going from here to here, I just said, oh, we're dividing by 1. We don't need it. From here to here, that's where I use the fact that our sums are telescoping. So all the inner terms are going to cancel each other out. I'll just be left with fi here and fi here. Yeah? And this is what we wanted. Why does this look like what we want? Because remember, our goal overall is to try to prove that with the t we chose, this remainder is sublinear. So, I've got to know what's the difference between f at p plus v and f at p, yeah? So, I'm working on that. I've slowly kind of figured out these two. Now, I'm going to compare that with this row times this column. And hopefully, this minus this minus this times this, which is my remainder, is sublinear, okay? So, <clears throat> I've got that first difference here. And now on the right-hand side, let's work on that. Well, over here, we should be able to use our formula for the derivative that we computed, right? And we're going to relate this derivative to the partials of fi, right, to those partials. Let me see. It was more complicated than that, right? So we said, oh, it's up here. Copy. Paste. So I'm going to have these. And I have the sum over j, okay? And let's see what we can do with these. Um, well, I guess kind of the thing to know, or uh, kind of the thing to remember, is that this pj minus 1 plus tij, vjej, is somewhere along sigma j, right? So this is somewhere along the path sigma j. So maybe that's helpful for me to write out. Now, we're slowly working through. We are ready to add in our linear term. So we're trying to approximate fi at p plus v. We're saying it's this constant plus a linear 
plus the remainder, and we want to show that the remainder is sublinear, yeah? Okay, so now let's add that linear part. And we'll say, so now for the linear term, I'm going to take my A. Now, if I'm looking at the ith row, right, so like Fi, I'm looking at the ith row, how do I get the ith row? component of this product, well, I need the ith row dotted with this vector. So, what is <laughs> what is this ith row going to be? Um, I'm still going to have the partials with respect to xj of fi at p times vj, okay? So, my linear term for that ith component. So the ith component of TV or AV will be, um, we said we're going to take the jth partial of fi at p and multiply it by v j. And j is going to run from 1 to n. Okay? So now, the remainder for, or the remainder for the ith component will be this minus the linear term. So I'll have this sum minus this. Okay, so let me copy this. I probably should have, shouldn't have written there. Copy. Paste. So we'll have this minus, copy, paste. So minus this, okay? Then we say, aha, we notice some similarities. In particular, we're adding up n terms And each of the terms looks like the product of something times vj. So we can combine some of this. So we'll have the sum and vj times what? Let's see here. So I'll have the partial with respect to xj of fi at pj minus 1 plus t i, j, v, j, e, j. Okay, that's way too long. Okay. Just going to write sideways. Okay. So I will have the partial with respect to x, j of f, i at that point there minus the partial with respect to x, j of fi at p. I'm going to say that point on the uh, so somewhere along the path sigma j. Guaranteed to exist by the mean value theorem. Okay. So, here's the idea. This is my remainder for the ith component. I 
And believe it or not, we are ready to go to step three. Look back at the picture. We're talking about the partial of Fi here at P versus the partial of Fi like at some point along one of these little segments, right? Our partials are continuous. As V goes to zero, this point here is going to get closer and closer to P. So the, the points on the paths must also get closer to P. Continuity of the partials imply these values are getting very close to these values as V approaches zero, okay? So now, let's get ready for step three, putting it all together. Okay, our ith remainder. is sublinear because, okay, I need to take this and show, copy, that this over this goes to zero as V goes to zero. That's our goal, right? Here's how I'm gonna do it. <clears throat> Do you notice how this is a dot product? You see how this is a dot product? I've got each of these terms and I'm multiplying them by the, right, V1, V2, da, 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 Vn. I've got all these terms here. I'm using Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. To say this, the norm of this is going to be less than or equal to, and you can guess what it is probably, less than or equal to the norm of this. times the norm of V. Yes? And so now, when I divide by my norm of V, this is going to go to zero because these will cancel out, and this goes to zero by continuity of my partials. So continuity of the partials implies sublinearity. Oh, please don't make me. Well, no, I'll go ahead and <laughs> sublinearity. Sublinearity of that remainder. Ith component. And then, of course... If each component is sublinear, then the whole thing is sublinear. So we're done. Okay, and I can kind of briefly go through and show you that with the example, because I kind of started off by saying, let's work through this example. This was the example we had on the board. Um, this was a function we had. These are our different component vectors. Right, this was our matrix for our derivative, and I computed the remainder. So I said, okay, here's our remainder, here are our remainder functions, and it just gets so messy and unwieldy, right? And here's our point one comma two, and our, uh, what does it look like, our P plus V, you're going over here and going up here, 
It's so unwieldy. The computations, um, the term is obfuscate. So the computations don't make things clearer. They make things more, um, more complicated. They obfuscate what's actually happening. So, yeah, it did kind of run through it, but it just, it wasn't helpful, we'll say. But yeah, so let me know if you have questions about this. Um, hopefully, hopefully this video is helpful and kind of explains every, every little detail of the proof. All right, see you soon.